Namaskar. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. We have a visitor who has already been on our channel once before. The journalist. He lives in the Washington D.C. area and he has ancestry that runs way back, so far back that he is part of the the family that uh, or, or Suri Ratna princess who, who had migrated to South Korea. So we are going to be hearing from him a lot about this connect and also. how it translates to current uh, south korea so let's welcome sehun kim sehun namaskar and welcome to p guru's channel thank you so much for having me so um, I, i i apologize i have the wrong uh, overlay here let me just get rid of that one second sorry about that guys so uh, hang on my apologies um, sehun um, we talked about this last time we were on uh, a different topic we were talking about uh, uh, you know hinduism and things like that and you mentioned that you know you have ancestry that leads back to uh, you know this we can talk about that you can tell us exactly how that is but before more more importantly you know you did a very successful event in washington dc about the influence of ramayana across e- asia maybe you can touch upon a little bit of that and then we can jump into our topic today which is princess suri ratna uh, thank you so much for having me again uh, it's it's always a honor to be on here um well to uh, to address your first uh, question you know uh, the the event in uh, in in the US congress which was the ramayana across asia uh, took place uh, in with the hopes that the US congress would uh, do their best to try to understand um the influence of the ramayana in 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 the whole of asian region because the uh, the story itself has had a, a, a tremendous impact in building up the um influences and 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 the societal uh, norms of so many countries around southeast asia particularly and 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 beyond as well as as, as we have shown um it was all also conduct, conducted and uh, con- conducted by uh, our good friends in hindu action uh, particularly by our good friend uh, utsav chakrabarty and all the other team and um and it was it was successful because it was successful but also at the same time extremely significant given the fact that the ram mandir is going it, it was going to be opening and also at the same time it it literally brought all these nations together to say you know there are differences uh, politically right now but in a sense in in terms of our heritage it only shows that we are one so it it, it was it was successful on, on multiple facets both on a policy level but on a but on a heritage level as well sehun web series korean web series are among the most popularly watched in india especially on netflix like netflix has a fair amount of coverage content and it, this is very popular in india as well as in in the united states i mean i got hooked on i gave it to my family everybody watches just about every web series that comes up because there's so much <laughs> cultural connect uh i mean i love it uh, especially there was this one thing about uh, what is the 15 anyway it's okay um, i i uh, the, the one that i really liked was called as chief of staff okay uh, chief All of right. staff the guy who was the progenitor there protagonist he is also in that new thing that game that you have where pe- people get eliminated Oh, Squid Remember? Games, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Squid Games, right? He was the main character in that one too, and and it was so relatable. I mean, beautiful, beautiful web series that they put out, and and uh, anyway, so this connect is increasing. I mean, that's how I found out that the names for calling your parents, like mom is Amma and dad is Appa, this is actually Tamil words that evidently one Tamil princess. took back to south korea we talked about it in the last time but today mm-hmm. we are going to talk about suri ratna with your permission i'll start mm-hmm. the first slide show and you can start talking to that here we go sure okay so as you can see um you know we 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 see you know we we see that there is a legend right and it is called only a legend because it it just happened so long ago and Unfortunately there's no uh, there's no set historical record um in you know in the world except uh, traces of it both in Ayodhya in in India right now 
or as we call it also in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh or and and um, in a in a historical records of, of South of Korea, which um, is in the uh, the Korean National Museum today. And the book is called Samgugusa. So as you can see, um, we have the two figures there. Um, and, the, and, you know, the, the beauty about it is this, is that we can actually see the heritage and the his, the historical aspect of it from two different art, uh, artworks, right? So you have the artworks of the, the traditional Korean artworks, which was, which had a lot of, uh, which is in, in a sense, uh, you can, you can call it one of the main identities of the East Asian, um, uh, you know, uh, culture as well. So you can look, look at through that lens, right. But also at the same time, um, as, as, as I will show you in, in a, in a little bit, there is, there are, um, you know, artworks actually uh, presented uh, through the, in, in the, the Indian, the Indian lens as well. So, um, so this, uh, the two, two pictures, as you see it right now, um, we actually call it, uh, we actually have a name for it, which is uh, the king himself is called King Suro. And the other, uh, the other uh, lady, as you can see, is, is Queen Suryatna, but to us, she is the Queen uh, Ha. So next slide, please. Thank you. So, uh, so as you can see, this is basically the um, the historical record or the book uh, that can, that sort of contains the traces of uh, that that period. It's called Samgugusa. This was a uh, this was a time when Korea, uh, the Korean Peninsula, as we call it, way before North and South Korea, right, um, was actually formed into three kingdoms. Uh, uh, the up up the upper part of the Korean kingdom was called Korea, and then the southern there were two other kingdoms within um, the south the south called Pekche and Shilla. Uh, but we're actually going to talk about we're actually going to talk a little bit uh, about the another kingdom that existed in around the province that I personally come from. So next slide, please. So, yes. so as you can see, uh, I'll, I'll just read the slide because uh, this is a uh, th th this is extremely fascinating. So according to Samgugusa, uh, the a 13th century Korean historical chronicle, which I would 100% recommend everybody to read because this it's it's it just shows the dynam the foundational dynamics of the history of the Korean Peninsula for those who are interested in Korean history. So I really recommend you to, uh, you know, do your research on that. But according to this historical uh, chronicle, the India-Korea friendship began in 48 AD. So notice how, how I said it was, it's, it's a legend because it was so far long ago. And that's, and, and as you can see, it, it's, you know, since it happened around that time, you know, the world in a sense was, uh, and was entering into another millennia, right? So, um, there's a significant there, and and uh, when Princess Suri Ratna, or the precious gem, as we as we understand her to be for, uh, journey from Ayodhya, India, to Korea to marry King uh, Suro, uh, and and subsequently became the Queen uh, Ho, Ho Hang Ok, which is uh, which is in, in Korean it means uh, yellow jade of the Gaia Kingdom. Now. Do you remember? Uh, remember me telling you there are, there were three kingdoms initially, um, right, but right. around that time, uh, after the arrival of Queen Sri Ratna, the uh, there was another kingdom that was found in the province that I come from, which was called the Kaya Kingdom, or in, a, in another translation, also known as the Kayak Kingdom, like kayaks, right, uh, in in the river. So, uh, next slide, please. So, what do the legends say? Well. I'll just give you the uh, the watered down uh, summary version of it. So basically, what happened was Queen Suri Ratna's parents, who were kings in Ayodhya at the time, um, they fell asleep one day, and Bhagwan, as we call it, or God, or in, in through our translation, it, uh, it they're shown as these uh, the the heavenly beings actually uh, reveal themselves to the king and queen. And told them that uh, your daughter Sri Ratna was 16 years old at that time. Um, needs needs to uh, take a boat. Uh, from what we know, I from what I uh, and, and there are two and there are theories about this. Either she left from the uh, from what we know is the Kolkata area or from Tamanaru. But in any case, uh, take a boat and 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 I we will and I will guide her through her journey. And at the end of her journey, her husband will be waiting for her. Um, in in a distant land, and so um, they they woke up, and the other uh, legends also goes that uh, Queen Suryana also herself had her own revelation about this, um, and the next day they they uh, they prepared a vote, and 
they follow the the C coordinates, as we call it, or the guidance of, of Bhagwan or the the heavenly being, right, from India all the way into the into what we know as the Korean Peninsula today. And so it was, in in a sense, a a trip a trip that involved a huge le- leap of faith, right? Because essentially, you 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 don't know where you're going, right? And and look, and and if you look at the geography of India at that time. You know, um, it was surrounded by civilizations that were completely just uh, it, it, uh, they connected, but also at the same time uh, foreign to each other. Much, much less just uh, going all the way to a land that had initially no historical contact uh, together, right? And so um, they went all. She went all the way to uh, Korea, and at the end of her journey, uh, a day before she arrived, the legend goes that King Suro uh, apparently also had a dream. Uh, telling her, uh, t- telling him, and uh, fr- telling him that uh, well, it's from the same heavenly being, or uh, if from our translation, a, a a a foreign heavenly being that we were not aware of, telling telling him to go out into the uh, by by the beach, and await for her arrival at uh, at a particular time uh, with his entire entourage, because his uh, the wife that the heavens have prepared for you will be arriving, and. You know, and this was also significant because you know King Sura, according to the legends, um, were approached by so many court officials and military officials, family members, and so on and so forth, uh, to marry somebody within his clan, within um, his uh, his his area of influence. But King Sura, much like uh, much like the decisions that he made uh, at that time, um, he actually uh, took his own stance and said. Well, I have a feeling that I shouldn't get married uh, for now. But when she arrived, um, it was just love at first sight. And um, apparently they were able to connect with each other. Um, and shortly thereafter, uh, Queen Suryatna became uh, what, we, what we know as Queen uh, uh, Huang Hok, who ended up becoming the first in- Indian empress, right? Gaia Kingdom was also, in, in a sense, an empire of its own. Um, of 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 the Korean Peninsula, and so they had um, they had uh, you know several cho- I think up to like six or seven children, and um, there were two uh, there were two last names uh, that um, that originate from uh, from that clan. Now here's the thing, as you can see, my last name is Kim, right? And and you'll say, okay, well, how is that different from the the crazy dictator from up north, right? That threatens to kill everybody all the time. Well, here's the thing, just because you're a clan, just because because you're a Kim, that doesn't mean that you belong to the same clan. My clan actually has been in the southern part of Korea for since thousands of generations, probably since Adam and Eve, right? And so um, we we have been there, and essentially what happened was, you know, we, our clan actually uh, kept the name Kim, but um, you know, it, our, our line, our the line of influence or, or the line of heritage actually w- wasn't lost. There were, and. You know, in, in in one sense, there's not many of us left, but um, there are uh, Kims that uh, descend from that line. But also, there are um, those with the last name Her, who also share the same um, heritage as well. And so, it's a, it's a very fascinating story. Um, and and some say that you know, there, there's a lot of uh, questions as to uh, as if if this is real or not. And so, uh, next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so as you can see, there are so many um, people who and, and people of influence as well that share this heritage. Um, uh, one of them was the uh, the former president of Korea. We have a prime minister. We had a former prime minister who also shared this heritage, and uh, the former first lady of the previous administration, the Moon administration. She also was the descendant of that. Um, of uh, of Queen Sri Ratna, and so um, as 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 it happens to a lot of the South, the official South Korean delegation visits to India, uh, Yogi Adityanath actually prepares a special ceremony for all Korean delegation, especially for those who are descendants of uh, Queen Sri Ratna, to come and just simply participate in and in being enamored by the the heritage and the history of Ayodhya itself. Um, now, one thing to remember is this, is that there is a, a bit of a debate whether or not it was actually in Ayodhya, um, as we know it today, in Uttar Pradesh, or it was in two other places. Um, the, other, the other interpretation is that some, some say 
that the Ayodhya that was mentioned in this story is actually from Tamil Nadu, what we know as Tamil Nadu today. And you, and you mentioned that, you know, we have very uh, similar language, uh, language similarities and, and all that. But also at the same time, the word Amma and Appa, right? It's in Tamil. But in, in the sense, if we, if, if we say that, you know, the word uh, Amma itself or Amma is also spoken by uh, those who speak Tibetan up, on, up, up in North India as well, right? So it, there's a lot of fascination there too, but there's, there, there are other, um, other theories, which I, it wasn't, and again, I, I, I personally, I, I wouldn't back that up, but the other theory is that it essentially, the Ayodhya is, was misinterpreted um, as, uh, as Ayuta, and she, uh, Queen Surin uh, sent, uh, was originally actually from uh, Thailand itself. And uh, some of that was actually written in the 1300s, not uh, back, back in the 48, uh, 48 AD when, when she existed. But if you think about it, right, where does the word Ayuta in, 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 Tha- in even uh, in place like Tamil Nadu or even um, uh, Thailand come from? Well, we know that it actually comes from Ayodhya originally from and what we know is the Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh today. So um, I think it's all, only safe to say that Queen Surana was indeed from Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh. And so, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a fascinating factor there. So next slide, please. Yeah, and so, um, you know, there are modern interpretations of it. I think you mentioned uh, the uh, Korean dramas. There were Korean drama called Kim Suro, actually. Uh, it's, uh, the the telling of King King uh, Kim uh, King King Suro who uh, you know who created this whole kingdom and did all this stuff. He was actually a military general, by the way, as well. And um, we had a story of Queen Surya. Now, obviously, it wasn't by an Indian act- actress, um, but everybody sort of knew the idea of it. And and now today, um, there are cartoons, short cartoons that really um, tells uh, the. Uh, the heritage uh, of of the story itself, but really they focus a lot on the beauty of the story, right? The the leap of faith, the love at first sight, right? The the heaven, the divine decree, right? It's it was it's a marriage between um, the East Asian perspective with the South Asian perspe- perspective all those years ago. So anyone who's saying that you know, well, these are just two different worlds that really initially have has no. Uh, connections together. Well, I'll, I'll say just l- look again and see the uh, the story of King uh, Queen Suryatna. And so, next slide, slide please. So uh, there you have it. Uh, you know, this is uh, uh, is for those who want to uh, research a little more about the story. Please uh, go ahead. And again, this is a beautiful story of two worlds just coming together, right? With the divine leap of faith, and um, and I would say through divine will, and so um, it it also show, in final I would I would say that the story shows that humanity in a sense is indeed one, right? And no matter what the differences are, whether religiously, politically, and whatnot, and so I think uh, my heritage really showed that all those years ago, and that's that, that's the the great lesson that we can you know keep all all, all the way to the end. So thank you so much. That's wonderful, Sehun. Um, a couple of things that you know, I um, I wanted to add to what you said. Navigation in the you know early days, uh, it is believed that uh, India didn't have compass. There's, there was there was no compass that would show you. But there is a special breed of monkeys. They call them Devang or Devavak. Uh, it, it's a breed that is available. I mean, that's seen in Tamil Nadu, for example. Mm-hmm. And this this monkey, no matter where it will always sit facing north. So if you put these monkeys on the ship, they know that whichever direction the monkey is sitting is your north, north pole. So their navigation aids were two, the stars and and this. And they would only um, navigate when the ocean winds allowed you to go from east, uh, I mean from India towards, uh, to go east. And then they would have to wait six months to come back because that's when the tide turns, the ocean, the winds turn. Then they would again take because this is all sails. There was no mechanized uh, way to go there, right? The the other legend that is very uh, you know uh, mentioned a lot in Indian folklore is that the uh, the merchants that went from India when I mean, they would they would take spices, silk. Silk was the most important, most sought after, I guess. Plus a lot of jewelry, jade, jade, all precious stones and things like that. They would 
go from uh, India and then they would touch on all these ports all the way up to Japan. And the, the person who is selling, so what happens is it's like a barter. You, you go and give some precious stones. In exchange, you get something back. And then the other person says, okay, next time you come, you bring all these things. And the person tells him that if I don't make the voyage the next time, my son will bring it for you. And, and they had established this reputation so well that they were considered the most trustworthy people. Because they see the value, I don't know what language they conversed in. I mean, at least to the Midwest, I'm sorry, Middle East, they are supposed to have had a language called Mlecha. There was some amount of formalization under King Ashoka in 3rd century BC, where you know he, he formalized a lot of things. But I don't really know what happened in this case. I'm, my memory also is sketchy. But the point I think I'm trying to say is trade existed as way back as you know in, in, in BCE. Um, now, Sehun, one thing I wanted to ask you today. Uh, you know, we see a lot of traces of Buddhism in South Korea. I've traveled. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to look at any Hinduism sites in South Korea. Are there any? Well, you know, we actually follow the Korean actually the Korean heritage involves a heavy amount of Mahayana Buddhist influence in the yeah. country, right? And and it's it's it, it's also important to remember that it wasn't always it's, as you as you may have seen. Um, in, Buddhism wasn't always influential in the country. Initially, what happened was um, the Korean Peninsula itself was, a, and until this day right now, um, was a very Confucian uh, and Taoist focused nation. And so there were uh, certain codes and certain beliefs that the the Korean um, the Korean people actually followed. And when Buddhism actually initially came in, it actually went through a, a, a season of persecution. Right. And so because it, it was seen as something that was foreign, something that wasn't compatible with the beliefs that existed at the time. But over the centuries, it it it, it began to ha it began to catch interest among uh, the elite ev everywhere from the elite class all the way to the lowest of the low. And, 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 and one thing to remember is that the. Uh, the, the temples itself, right, pr provided at certain times a uh, haven for, for those who uh, were poor and, were, and didn't have anywhere to go because they would take in um, those who were um, the lowest of the low to, to be monks. And that's how and, and, and that's how they were able to sustain and, and, and sustain themselves and also at the same time um, a flourish in Buddhism. Uh, I think the the biggest influence, the the biggest um, influence, and the officialization of the Buddhist uh, presence in Korea came when Buddhism actually entered into the realm of politics. Um, after a few centuries, you you see kings and everyone, everyone from kings to uh, military officials to um, even um, even concubines, right, accepting Buddhism and 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 really getting in getting in uh, touch with the uh, the teachings there. I think that's where we see the traces of Hinduism, because Mahayana Buddhism, in, in a sense, originated heavily from Hindu um, influence as well, right? And so we even see this within the Chinese Buddhism, and you know some of the legends within Chinese Buddhism. You see, uh, you see the you know the the remnants of the stories of Ramayana, although unfortunately under the the communist government in China right now, a lot of that has been suppressed. But in Korea, um, you know, the I think instead of just looking at it through a storyline i think the the teachings of hinduism coming from coming from the uh, the teachings of in, in the form of buddhism uh, is something that uh, that needs to be noted and, and plus um, there is there is certain theories that sanskrit also had a, a huge influence around uh, the korean language the formation of the korean language and and plus you have to remember during the mongol uh, empire right the yuan dynasty the um the, the the empire actually allowed free travel within its realm and so it's very possible that the um there were hindu traders uh or tibetan traders with hindu uh, with trace of hindu beliefs right coming in and out there was even a um there was even a historical trait the historical records of uh, certain korean um traders or even uh, politicians really marrying into uh, uh, people within the other other realms and so 
Um, I, I think that's probably the best trace. Now, now again, in the modern times, you know, you can, uh, you'll be, you'll be very happy to know um, there are ISKCON is actually pretty vibrant um, in in Korea, and and uh, there is, from what I understand, a a Korean. Uh, Hindu guru actually that operates in in South Korea right now and so um, but historically I think it's safe to say that there are traces of Hinduism within Korea through the form of Buddhism we're not like uh, Japan where I, I would say over 80 percent of the Japanese gods for example are are actually in a different form of Hindu gods right and and even from there you see that the, the uh, they come in in forms of Shintoism and Buddhism and, and other things as well so yeah it's, it's a very complicated mix of uh, mix of baskets but it's you you'll it's 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 a hidden gem it's it's all absolutely right. yeah. absolutely and uh, the 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 thing that blows me away Sehun is that you know we pick up all these nuggets here and there uh, I'm not sure where the Korean script, which looks similar to Japanese and, and Chinese, I'm not, I'm not saying it is. They are very significant different characters. I know. I've, I, I've tried to make some sense of it. But uh, see, the Khmer script, that is in, in Kampo, Cambodia, they, they used to call it Champa Nagari. Champa is a flower, I guess, that was prevalent there. So again, this uh, today's Myanmar, uh, was called Brahma Desa, land of Brahma. And and so that became Burma under the British. And now they have gone back to the equivalent of, uh, I mean, in, in Burmese language, now they call it uh, Myanmar. The, the, the river that goes all through from China down to the delta, through Laos, Thailand, and Myanmar, Mekong, actually one interpretation is it was as big as Ganga, Ganges. So they call it Ma Ganga. So that Ma Ganga over period of time uh, it became Mekong. So there is so many you know civilizational connect. The Khmer script, which is used in some languages, not all, is very very close to it's it's derived. It has the same grammatical moorings as Sanskrit. Today's Devanagari, which is what Hindi use, uses, and you know take any Indian language. There are twenty one official languages. They all follow the same grammar. It may be written differently. So I had a uh, specialist show me how from a particular thing called Brahmi script, which was a basis from Brahmi, all these things evolved. And he says about how, you know, those days probably sculptors were sculpting it. If you accentuated a particular thing like a cut or something like that, initially whoever did that, that stayed for the region. That's how we have so many languages, but the culture in India is the same. Very interesting uh, situation because people speak different languages, but they all relate back to Rama. Rama is the same. <laughs> it doesn't matter which corner you go to. So this, right. this binding influence that this Ram Mandir has brought about is, you know, you have to see it to believe it. I heard like, you know, um, it was amazing. People were celebrating it like they were celebrating Diwali, the festival of lights, which is considered the most celebrated festival for Hindus. So, Sehun, thank you so much for uh, laying it out for us and helping us understand the, the Korean culture. We have a few questions from our viewers, if you don't mind. Sure. Can, can I go ahead and ask them? Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah, one moment, please. Messi fan, thank you for becoming a YouTube member. You are you are a big draw, Venkat Surya Rao Murthy. Thank you for becoming a YouTube member. <laughs> and <laughs> Atul Kumar Srivastava, thank you for becoming a YouTube member. All of you who have become members, you heard the original, uh, the starting tune on Ram Mandir that I played. You, if you want to make it as a ringtone, you can download it from our site. You have to be a member. All those of you who are members, you can download that uh, ringtone for free. Next question. GK wants to know, the second highest number of missionaries are from South Korea. What is happening in South Korea? Well, okay, I'll, I'll say this. I'm personally, I'm a Christian myself, right? So, but you know, it's uh, it, it in a sense, Korea is also an extremely spiritual country, and so uh, you know, as 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 you may have uh, heard, uh, Buddhism was essentially uh, a persecuted religion at, at first, right? But it flourished, right? It actually had a huge amount of influence, and in a sense, you should also know. Korean Buddhism also has a huge influence around the world. I mean, it, it attracts so many people. Every it, it attracts uh, monks and lay people from 
everywhere uh, from the United States to Sri Lanka. There are actually Sri Lankan monks that all go all the way to Korea to train from Nepal and everything else. And so, yeah, I mean, I think in any in any nation with a, a great Christian population, you'll see missionaries uh, going going forth and, and such. And so um, in a sense, it's it's uh, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure to some, you know, it's a very uh, it's a very uh, questionable topic. But I, but um, but despite this, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, despite the, uh, the, the beliefs, um, I think the more important thing about this story and even just the, the connection to Ayodhya itself and everything that's going on in Ayodhya itself um, is, is a sign that although, although some of us may be Christians or Hindus or Buddhists or whatever it may be, um, our heritage always uh, unites us together at the very least. And so um, I, I, I think if, if that's a point of worry, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I, um, no, it, I, it's uh, just an observation. I wouldn't <laughs> right. say it's a point of worry <laughs> right. at all. Not, right. not at all. And, and, and Sehun, see what is happening is, remember there was this place called Nalanda University, which the Bhaktiar Kilji, a relative of Alauddin Kilji, burnt it down. It burnt for three months. Mm -hmm. Now, most of the uh, scripts, texts were lost. At, this is 13th century. But interestingly, before that, many people from Tibet and, and other areas came to uh, India. They understood this and they translated it into Tibetan. And they took back these texts back with them to Tibet. Right. Now, my good friend Rajiv Malhotra is actually funding a couple of projects to recreate the original Sanskrit manuscript from the Tibetan manuscript that are still preserved till today. Mm -hmm. so, so at least people are trying to say, wait, let us find out what used to be there. And, and there are very few people in India even today who can read Prakrit and Brahmi and interpret that. So, so to just to give people a quick, uh, you know, faster one-liner about it, Prakrit is the precursor to Sanskrit. So Prakrit means nature. Sanskrit is refined nature. There is a guy called Panini who formalized the language. In fact, he did such a good job that Sanskrit is considered the best language to use if you want to use like a computer programming language. Of course, we all have to learn Sanskrit. Then we can program in Sanskrit. <laughs> that becomes right. easy. So there are a few steps there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. And that's and that's the that's the beauty of it, right? Like we are in a sense, I think we we entered into an era where we are we're searching for our heritage again i, I think that's that's a great journey to, to be on altogether yeah yes 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 partha wants to know with asia pushing internal growth of economy some claim ancient chinese buddhist temples are regaining visitors across asia including china and south korea is this true um well, this actually has a huge political angle to it. You know, the 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 Chinese Communist Party actually has been uh, been ruthlessly campaigning for the the whole Buddhist uh, diplomacy, uh, much like the the Buddhist diplomacy that uh, Prime Minister Modi actually engaged in initially from the beginning of uh, of, of his time in office. Uh, and so, what they're what they're trying to say is, well, look. Um, we actually are united in Buddhism in our in our shared heritage of Buddhism, and um, if you want to if you want to have better relations, I think we should do it. We should have uh, in a, a starting point from Buddhism itself. Well, firstly, the Chinese are essentially copying it from uh, Prime Minister Mo Modi's, or it seems strongly suggests that if they're they're uh, copying it from Prime Minister Modi's uh, Buddhist diplomacy that he engaged in, but also you know it's it. To answer your question, I, I don't think it's succeeding and it's only succeeding on probably maybe on a political level, maybe on a, you know, on a, I don't know, in certain individual temple uh, politics. But uh, overall, everyone knows that, you know, when you when it comes to Buddhism, it's India, it's South Asia, it's Nepal, it's 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 all it's it's in that area because that's where Sakyamuni Buddha actually originated. Right. Uh, and, and, and more importantly, people do you can't forget, you know, Sakyamuni Buddha was a Hindu prince, right? And in certain parts of Hinduism, he's actually uh, considered as a god. And so um, I, I think in terms of the economic growth um, aspect of it, I think China's, uh, China is, it feels extremely threatened by the growth of India, 
because look, India is the only country with all of the um, similar aspects, like having the same um, population all the way to having so many uh, young people who are uh, who are innovative and such, right? But although in China, it's very suppressed, um, the CCP feels extremely threatened uh, from my view, and they're uh, they're trying to see if they can do they can achieve the same amount of success that india did through this uh, this uh, buddhist uh, diplomacy and for those and so and so thank you for that question so for those who are aware um, please don't fall for that <laughs> that stupidity and and always remember where buddhism where hinduism actually originated and which is what we know as india or the greater south asia region today thank you and in one of my books i've actually captured buddhism in china there is an island called hainan Mm -hmm. And just outside Hainan, there's just like, you know, Empire State Building, not Empire, what the Li Liberty statue, just on a small island, Staten Island, right? So like that, there is an island and, and that there is, I think, a three-headed Saraswati from what I could make sense of. So these things still exist. People do go there and pray. Even though you can say China is a communist state, there are people who do pray. There are some pockets. Uh, it is believed that the Falun Gong alone has close to 80 million followers in China. It's about 10%. I think another 10% are Christians in China. Uh, so the, it's all underneath because communism is fairly, you know, uh, uh, what do you call as Gnostic? That is, uh, I don't know, um, atheistic. Uh, and no, no religion in communism. That's what they try to teach you. So that is overbearing their... Uh, under some general secretaries, it is loosened a little bit, and then they go back and tighten it again. This is an exercise that has been going on for a long time. So we will wait and see because the underlying underpinning things never go away. That is the point. Shreyasta Samal wants to know, could you also highlight the present day scenario in South Korea and India as some news highlights that present day South Koreans are more Americanized and lost touch with ancient history? Well, I think it's that, that the question actually uh, touches upon the effect of modernism, right? We, uh, you know, in the recent history, Korea went through, you know, so many. So it's um, it, just in the 20th century alone, um, it, it went through so many events that it was personally involved in, right? The liberation from Imperial Japan all the way to right after, five years after that, the Korean War. And everyone was just absolutely focused on how do we make ourselves better? You have to remember in the 1950s, Korea had, Korea's GDP was lower than that of Somalia, right? And we were getting aid from, uh, you know, all, countries throughout the world, everywhere from ranging from the United States all the way to Haiti, right? And so, um, and we remain grateful to all those countries, but, you know, and, but our fo main focus was, okay, how do we, how, how do we rise above and, and rise out of the ashes? And, and, and to answer your question, yes, um, there's a lot of Americanized influence, but, you know, in, in a sense, in a greater sense, um, there, there's a lot of uh, the modern influence that, uh, that took place in Korea. Now, um, the, the beauty of what we have now, though, is that since people do not no longer, in a sense, largely have to worry about uh, food or anything like that, you know, in, in, you know, in, in the level of our, our, our brother and up north, uh, at, at the very least, um, people are sort of looking into this type of heritage. And, and, and again, uh, being a millennial, um, I've had the privilege and the opportunity and, and the growing interest to look into my own heritage. A lot of uh, our, my fellow uh, clan members are the Kim, the Kims of Kimi region. They don't, I mean, they don't really look into this stuff, right? Um, and I'll tell you something really fun. Uh, the, in North Korea from w one of the escapees actually told me is that um, the, everyone who shares the name last, the last name Kim, identifies themselves uh, either as largely as the Kims of Kimei region, right? The, the descendants of uh, Queen Sri Rana. One of the only reasons is because um, it, a lot of those Kims actually share the same heritage as the Kims up north, uh, the same Kim, the clan uh, of the, the North Korean dictator, <laughs> Kim, Kim Jong-un. And in that country, it's actually forbidden for you to be put yourself on that level. So they in, instead opted to identify with uh, with the, the Kims of Kimi. Whether they know about the story or not, I think it's irrelevant, right? So as I said, Korea is a place where you see elements and hidden gems of everything. And so all you have to do is just uh, dig it up a, a little more. 
And plus, I, you know, to answer to the other part of answering your question, I would say this is that, you know, that's, that's not entirely true. There's a lot of, there's a huge interest in, in, um, in the ancient histories of Korea. And personally, I would never have known about this whole uh, Queen Sri Ratna story had my father not told me about it, or had I not even seen clips of it as a child of that, um, that, uh, that the Korean drama posted that I just showed you. So I, I, I think the, the, the growth is definitely there. Um, in terms of interest, I think, you know, practically the interest will grow a lot more uh, as we see the economic rise of India and the continual influence that it has all over the world. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely confident that uh, the interest will uh, be solidified and, and grow as much as possible in the, in the future. Thank you. And, uh, you know, have you seen Vincenzo web series? I, I I have seen clips of it. It's a it's a very <laughs> it's a very violent uh, drama from what I know, but it's very enjoyable. But it's it's funny though. It's funny because I got to understand a lot of the version of Buddhism that is practiced in South Korea. Well, viewers, watch it. It's fun. It it's <laughs> mafia meets uh, South Korea. What happened? But it's fun too. I liked it. It uh, I it's also saw the inter right. yeah on Netflix right. And it did the interplay between the characters and how Buddhism comes in and out of it. It was very interesting, I thought. Again, see, this is curiosity, you know. Uh, wow. Culturally, you know, South Korea as a family, right? They're very similar to Hindus. A Hindu family follows the same kind of tradition. Respect your elders. Listen to them. Don't go against them. Don't do anything that would, you know, uh, incur their wrath. All those family values, they're all there. So it's like, you know, you're watching a family next door. That's how it felt to me when I was, when I was watching that. The Chief of Staff is much more political. It is more like a political <laughs> thriller. That's a different cue. But this one, Vincenzo and, and a few other series that I watch, they all have that family underpinnings. And it gives you a very quick connectivity, connect with the, the story and the, the players. So it's very, very nice to see that thing. I, I really like the way the Korean <laughs> web series are presented. So. Anyway, that's just me. Those of you who like it, do put in a comment. Next, go to the next question. Shreyasta, again, what do South Koreans think of this ancient story? Are they open to Indians or do they like, uh, and do they like Indian culture? Uh, well, the ancient story itself is, is uh, unfortunately, it's not as well known um, in Korea. Uh, it's, and it, it, if, it's, if, if it's known, it's, it's just viewed as, oh, it's a very interesting and a uh, very beautiful story. Um, but there is though, recently there is a, a, through social media, of course, a lot more people have become aware of the story. And so I, I'm pretty sure that with the continual, um, trend of, uh, the social media itself, um, it, people will, will, will take more interest in it. And so, uh, in terms of being open to Indians and Indian culture, well, Look, I and, and by no means I want to use this as an excuse, but uh, the Korean culture is uh, in a, is is a very um, it's a very homogenous culture. Although right now we see um, a bit of change now, right? So it's so many um, international visitors or international settlers, co immigrants coming into South Korea out of interest to K-pop, to economic reasons or even political reasons, right? Settling into the country. Um, but, you know, even in there, there is a bit of uh, challenges, right? Uh, in terms of accepting uh, those from other countries. And, and of course, there's, there's definitely tensions that happen uh, between uh, the two people. But, uh, but on the flip side, there are, there are folks who are specifically becoming a lot more interested in India, right? Um, and, and I would say this, the, uh, the first time where I saw a, a, a major Korean figure being interested in Korea was a very, very famous monk. He was actually, uh, I came across this club, clip on YouTube years ago where he said the best place to do a retreat, right, to, to experience the actual uh, uh, life itself, right, is India. Because, and he said this, when you go to China, not a, you, can't, you can't find a single person who can, who, uh, who can speak English, let alone their ABCs, right? But in India, you can not only communicate, you know, at least for a little bit, but you also see the beauty of smile, right? And the, the, the beautiful smiles of the people, even, even in, in even places where um, situation is, a, it's, is dire. And he said, 
you know, that's, uh, and, and again, I, I personally, I personally saw that as, as uh, in 2015, when I visited India, you know, India is one of the only countries that I've seen and that I'm convinced of that it, it actually has its problems outward. It's very transparent. Sometimes it's too transparent, some, some would say, but because, <laughs> but because of that, but because of that, I think, uh, I think the strength itself is, is, is emboldened naturally even more, right? So it doesn't need to artificially, uh, you know, push into it. And so as that grows, and as I said previously, um, the, when, when India, uh, by 2027, it's projected that India will be the third largest economy in the world. I personally think that it will probably be the second largest in the world. And, um, and with this in economic impact, people will have to uh, take notice and, and take interest in it. And, and look, you're, you're seeing the first case study, right? And not only because I, 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 um, uh, I share this heritage, but through research, through, through thorough research and thorough, um, in, interactions and thanks to a lot, a lot in part to my Tibetan friends, you know, I, I really, and I'll say this, I really discovered the product inside of me, right? And I'm sure there's a lot more people in, in, in the future um, in Korea and all over East Asia. You know, uh, viewers, if you have not listened to K-pop, do listen to it. It's very <laughs> melodic, just like Indian music. And my daughter introduced <laughs> me to K-pop oh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago. I love the music. Uh, and uh, also, you know, I was in, um, you know, I was in a mall in Seoul. I think it was 2000s, early 2000s, maybe 2004 or 2005, something like that. And guess what music was playing on the, there's a, you know, complete system for the entire mall, right? They were playing Daler Mehendi. This is a, this guy was a very popular singer and he's actually from US or Canada. I don't remember exactly, but his music was all over the place. I said, wow, out here you can listen to Daler Mehendi. So right. there is a, you know, there's a connect uh, because the music, the styles, all those are very, very similar. So, you know, we have to just rediscover all these things, you know, for a greater understanding and for a better world. Last question for you, uh, Sehun, before we wrap up. We've been talking for 45 minutes. I don't know if you realized it. I mean, oh, <laughs> time flew by. <laughs> <laughs> Chaitanya Takle wants to know, I'm studying Hangul. The syllables from the same origin from the vocal cord, e.g. ka and ga look similar. Is it a coincidence? Um, well, you know, I, I, I believe that humanity originated from one source in, in the beginning. And so maybe that has to do with it. But, you know, on, you know, but on a on more of a serious note, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, languages um, have similarities across Asia. And the Hangul itself was actually created um, in order to separate the Korean people away from uh, using just Chinese characteristics. Um, and because of the Confucian influence uh, in the air, in, 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 in history, even some, a lot of the Buddhist texts, as you, as you, uh, as you may see, if you go to Korea, it's in Chinese characters. And so uh, there was a king that came out um, a couple of hundreds of years ago, uh, King Sejong, as we call him, is actually the. He, there's a huge statue of him in this in, in the middle of uh, downtown Seoul, right in front of the um, the palace, uh, the old palace, where you should also go visit if you can. Very beautiful place. Um, there's a golden statue of him just sitting there like that, and he's the creator um, of, or he's the developer of Hangul. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a lot, a lot of people say it, it it's some, it somehow has, uh, a, a, um, some, a, a connection to Sanskrit itself, um, which I wouldn't be surprised because a lot of the developers had, um, teachings and, and, uh, Buddhism and, and Confucianism and whatnot. And so it's, it's very well possible. One of the other things to remember is that during the Yuan dynasty, there was a lot of Mongolization of Korea. So there's Mongols actually came, married into uh, the Korean, the ethnic Koreans at the time. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, a lot of the Koreans, including myself, we are, we're Mongol descendants as well. And so um, you look at the Mongolian language and the Tibetan language, right? There's a lot of similarities there because where did Tibetan language originate from, right? The, at least the, the scripts of it. It actually, it actually originated from Sanskrit, right? So um, in a sense, I'll, t I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, the masala, there was, there, I, I, I see this, there was a bowl of masala in, in, in India, right? Which somehow just, uh, and, and a huge wind came and just blew it all over the world. And some of them ended, ended up trickling in Thailand, Korea, or, or Japan and China in, in itself. 
And so, you know, that you know, the you'll, you'll, even though you might not see the entirety of it, you'll see you'll at least uh, have a bit of a taste of it if you uh, if, if you if you do your research. So thank you for pointing that out. And I think that's a, that's that's a great example of it. Thank you so much. And uh, Sehun, a parting thought. Um, when I was uh, traveling to Japan, one time I was at Narita International, you know, waiting for the immigration. And then there was a flutter. Uh, all the officials became very respectful. And then I saw two lines to my right was a well-dressed family. And, and the, the ladies wore what I would call very close to saris. The men wore robes. And, um, and the ladies were actually having a dot. I mean, what do you call a skunkum, right? She was having that. And, and, uh, and they were like accorded like royalty. And I knew it was not the king because I have seen the pictures of the king and the prince and so on. It was not the king. Then I was standing in the line and, and I was talking to my, the guy in front of me. And who are, who are they? He said, oh, this is the royal uh, priestly class. They were, they were the priestly family. And, and the reverence with which they were treated, mind-blowing, mind-blowing. I mean, you don't see them come out much. Maybe they are available. They, you can see them in Kyoto, which is where the religious heritage of uh, Japan exists. But in Tokyo, it was like a very interesting experience. Also, last question for you. You know, when the uh, United States went into Japan in 1945, and, and they did a lot of what I would call a standardization, one of the things that they did was the Japanese language is a very complicated language. We know all that, katakana and all that stuff. You, you can learn, you can spend a lifetime understanding the different versions of the, the there are three different flavors and so on. So what the, the Americans did was they made the newspapers, for example, periodicals all go from left to right. Whereas even today, if you buy a book, like a storybook or a fiction, the thing goes vertical. Right. Right. How is it in Korea? I'm just curious. Uh, you know, you can still see that, but uh, a lot of it has been standardized where we uh, read from uh, left to right already. Uh, I, I don't think you'll see a lot of younger generation, unfortunately, opting to be the, the top to bottom um, uh, you know, option. But, but when I was a kid, you know, there were, there were so many books like that still. And I, I'm really glad that I, I was a generation who was able to experience something like that. So if, if anything, I... I would highly recommend everybody to, just to answer the previous questions as well, um, to really take that first leap of faith like Queen Suri Ratna and really do your, and really do your research and, and, and do your best to, to explore into this. And, and plus, and, and at, at the end, as you may see in this story, there is going to be a great surprise waiting for you, something that was completely unexpected. And, and, and I think that's a beautiful way to wrap up this, this talk where, you know the this the story of Queen Suri Ratna is 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 um is a is a huge lesson to us all that um you know through the eyes of the divine no matter where we come from we're all the same we're all in this we're all in the need of same spiritual needs but more importantly um, all of us are are worth uh, being celebrated all of us more importantly are are are, are worth uh, being united uh, no matter what the cost is so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sehun. And viewers, uh, that was a wonderful trip down memory lane. I'd like Sehun to come back. He's a very, very accomplished man. And, and we'll be talking about more matters of, you know, world with him. And I can't tell, I can't thank you enough, Sehun. It was, this was a wonderful experience. We tried to do it a week ahead, but somehow things didn't match. But uh, finally, we got together and we'll be back with more such conversations with Sehun. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to click on the bell button for notifications. Namaskar.